Okay, if everybody please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, everybody be seated. And we'll move on to agenda item number four. We have a special presentation by Chief Dion. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Mayor Levy, Council, thank you for taking a little bit of time to uh, take care of a couple of awards that we have to present to two of our officers. Um, nowadays, there's so much scrutiny for what the police officers do that sometimes we forget some of the good things they do. So tonight, we have two officers I'm going to recognize for their life-saving efforts and the life-saving awards that I'm going to present to them. First one's going to be for Officer Brian Martinez. Brian, come on up here. On June 10th, 2015, Officer Martinez was dispatched to a burglary in progress. Officer Martinez noticed and contacted a male who was running from the area and then fell on the sidewalk. Through the course of their conversation, it was discovered that the man running from the area was, in fact, a man who had unlawfully entered a building and stolen some property that was now in his jeans. Officer Martinez placed him in custody, and while transporting him to the police department, the man, yelled, the man relentlessly yelled profanities at Officer Martinez. Once they got to the police department, Officer Martinez assisted him out of the poli police cruiser. The man looked at Officer Martinez with a blank stare, dropped to his knees, and then lost consciousness and quit breathing. Officer Martinez was able to determine that he was on heroin and alcohol at the time before he was arrested. And without skipping a beat, Officer Martinez began call, uh, CPR and continued until the man gasped for air and regained a pulse. Therefore, the Woodland Park Police Department hereby commends Officer Martinez for taking quick action which saved the life of a man, and we take pride in issuing this life-saving award to him. Congratulations, Brian. July 16, 2015, officers were dispatched to a resident in our city limits to the report of a man that had fallen off a ladder. Officer Couch arrived and determined that the man was not breathing and did not have a pulse. She started CPR in addition to her automated external defibrillator. The AD advised no shock was advised. She continued CPR until the medical personnel arrived and took over life-saving efforts. Her tireless efforts prolonged the man's life for a few more days making it possible for friends and family to say goodbye to him. Therefore, the police department would like to commend Officer Couch for taking quick action with pro which prolonged his life and take pride in issuing the life-saving award to her. Congratulations. It truly is a great family at our police department. And we appreciate it. Thank you all for being here. Okay, we move on to item number five. I don't believe there's any additions, deletions, or corrections. So we'll move on to the consent calendar and Suzanne. Thank you, Mayor Levy. This evening on the consent calendar, we have the minutes of the October 1st 
regular City Council meeting, and we have the August 2015 Statement of Expenditures. Questions, Council? If not, oh, I'm sorry. Approved. Great. Suzanne? Carlson? Yes. Harvey? Yes. Levy? Yes. Matthews? Yes. Mella? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you, Suzanne. Okay, no unfinished business tonight. Uh, we'll move on to ordinances on initial posting. And we're going to consider ordinance number 1252. And Aaron Smith, welcome. Yes, Mayor and Council, I'm filling in for Brian Flynn this evening. But I uh, have for you uh, on initial posting was, uh, ordinance 1252, which is simply an ordinance that approves the purchase of Lot 2, Vector Bank Subdivision, City of Woodland Park. Lot 2 is the parcel that is located, it was the former, um, the south, of the All -Star. south of the All-Star Gas um, store. And that um, is a um, subject to an agreement between uh, the City of Woodland Park and Vector Bank, which is a standard contract for purchase and sale of real property, and uh, the um, consideration that would be paid for that would include, would be $100,000, and I'd be happy to answer any questions at this time. Everyone familiar with this purchase? Yes. Any questions? Terrific. Move to approve an initial posting for uh, consideration at our next meeting. So uh, we're not okay. Thank you. And a second. Thank you, Harvey. Yes. Levy. Yes. Matthews. Yes. Mella. Yes. Carlson. Yes. Thank you. Motion carries five zero. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Okay, we move on to uh, number eight B and ordinance number twelve fifty three on initial posting. Welcome, Laura. Thank you, Mayor Levy. My name is Laura Pellegrino. I'm the city planner. This is a request by staff for first reading of ordinance number 1253. This is an ordinance for a conditional use permit for a use change for a proposed microbiology lab to be located in the neighborhood commercial zone, the NC zone in the city. In the existing building at 106 Village Terrace, Woodland Park, which is lot 7, the village, as represented by Nevada Ventures LLC and Brilliant Science Institute, and staff would also request that we set the public hearing for November 5th. Thanks. Council, any questions on simply on initial posting today? Move to approve on initial posting. Great. We have a second. Second. Thank you. No questions, Suzanne? Levy. Yes. Matthews. Yes. Mella. Yes. Carlson. Yes. Harvey? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries 5-0. Great. Thanks very much. We'll move on, Lord, to ordinance number 1254. Thank you, Mayor Levy. This is a request from staff for the first reading for ordinance 1254. It is an ordinance for a conditional use permit and concurrent site plan review for a proposed uh, assisted living facility to be located in the neighborhood commercial zone on lots 107, 117, 127, and 137 Village Terrace in Woodland Park, lots 1 through 4 of the village. This is a request by Woodland Park Storage, LLC, and RTB Development, LLC, and staff does also request that we set the public hearing for November 5th. Thanks, Laura. I know that's going to be a uh, interesting meeting, a lot of discussion, so November 5th, everybody will remember that. and. Do you have any questions relative to 1254? Well, this is a big project, and this first council has heard of it. So I don't remember. I think maybe I was out. But where, where is it located again? It's near the old Tweeds building, yeah. formerly the Paradox building as well. It's immediately west, east of that. East, behind it. Behind it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which was subject to something before. Okay, yes. Anything? Yeah. So, Anything else on initial posting? Move to approve on initial posting. Thank you. Second? Second. Okay, Suzanne? Matthews? Yes. Mella? Yes. Carlson? What? Carlson? Yes. Harvey? Yes. Levy? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries 5-0.
Thank you, Suzanne. Okay, Laura, we'll go for three in a row. Ordinance number 1256. I'm on a roll. This is a request by staff to consider ordinance number 1255 on initial posting. This is an ordinance for a vacation of the Village Terrace right-of-way. Um, as requested by Woodland Park Storage LLC and Nevada Ventures LLC, and it's also a request to set the public hearing for November 5th for this vacation request. Thank you. Council? No questions. We have to approve on initial posting. Number 1255. Got a second? Yes. Thank you. Suzanne? Mella? Yes. Carson? Yes. Harvey? Yes. Levy? Yes. Matthews. Yes. Thank you. Motion carries 5 0. Thanks, Suzanne. Okay, roll one more, number 1256. Thank you, Mayor Levy. This is to consider ordinance number 1256 on initial posting for vacation of the drainage and utility easements <coughs> within lots 1 through 4 of the village as requested by RTB Developments LLC and the Woodland Park Storage LLC. And it's also a request to set the public hearing for November 5th. Okay. Let's see if we can go five for five here. Move Four to for five. An initial posting. Second. Okay, Suzanne. Carlson. Yes. Harvey. Yes. Levy. Yes. Matthews. Yes. Mella. Yes. Thank you. Motion carries five zero. Thanks, Suzanne. Well, I'm sure we're going to see you on November fifth. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Okay, we will move on to public hearings. And we're going to start right away with ordinance number 1244 and Aaron Smith. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Excuse me, I need to recuse I'm myself. sorry, Ken. Excuse me. Uh, a, B, and A of the next issue also. Are we going to stay around so we can see you later? Well, you've got budget later, so I guess I will. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Matthews. <clears throat> Mayor and Council, what I will be doing is making a presentation on... Ordinance 1244, Ordinance 1251, and Resolution 796. And so my presentation will be on all of those, and it will be a combined presentation. What I will do for Council tonight is first remind you of the procedure, that, the procedure posture we are at and recap the procedure we've been through with Ordinances 1251, 1244, and Resolution 796. So I'll recap procedures. I will then walk Council through the substantive provisions um, that are the changes that we will be recommending uh, to the administrative regulations that are contained in Ordinance 1251 and walk you through the substantive change to Resolution 796. There aren't any changes to Ordinance 1244 from what Council saw on October 1st, so I will not walk you through any changes to Ordinance 1244. And then finally, the third thing, I will be recommending, um, I will be making a recommendation that Council approve both ordinances 1244 and 1251 and Resolution 796 tonight. Let me begin with the procedural posture or recap the procedure for these um, pieces of legislation. And let me start by saying that the City Charter requires four affirmative votes in order to pass an ordinance. So we have four council people here tonight. So in order to pass these, we would need four votes. I'll point that out. Then I would go on to say that we have made, I think, great progress. Um, we were tasked by council to um, sit down and talk with uh, Peak Internet and Peak's council because Peak had provided a number of comments to the uh, form of the administrative resolution regulations and uh, the fee resolution. And we have had those conversations and I believe we made great progress on those. So I would bring that to council's attention right up front. And I would look out to um, council uh, for Peak in the in the audience and uh, expect to see a head nod, so thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> let me then take you through the procedure. On October 1st, Council held a public hearing on both ordinances and took public comment on Resolution 796. Council did not continue the public hearing. Rather, Council tabled final action to tonight on both ordinances and Resolution 796 for the stated purpose of giving Peak Internet and its council 
time to review the changes made to the administrative regulations contained in Ordinance 1251. These changes were ones made to address the specific comments received by Peak Internet, uh, received from Peak Internet on September 28th and CenturyLink on September 30th. On October 6th, the city attorney and city staff met with Mr. Baker of Peak Internet, his counsel, Ms. Scott, and Mr. Spivey to go over the October 1st changes to the administrative regulations. The result of that meeting was that the city and Peak had found common ground on the few outstanding issues raised in Peak's September 28 comments, except for the comment regarding jail time as a possible penalty for violating the administrative regulations. In other words, except for the jail issue, the city and Peak had agreement in concept on all outstanding issues. On October 12th, a red line draft of the administrative regulations was given to Peak and put on the city's website on Tuesday, October 13th. This was supplemented on October 14th with one additional change provision Peak requested. Further, in response to comments um, on the Monday, October 12th draft received today at 3.30 this afternoon, city staff met again with Mr. Baker and his counsel, and the results of that meeting are a few other changes that I will address later. Which brings us to this evening. The draft of Ordinance 1251 and the administrative regulations contained in it is the draft distributed October 12th to Peak Internet and put on the, the website on October 13th. And it also then contains that change added by the October 14th supplement. So you have in front of you the administrative regulations um, that uh, we, in concept, have agreements with Peak on. Um, and uh, so those are what I will walk you through. So again, all of the changes, um, for the most part, in the draft redlined Ordinance 1251 are acceptable to peak. A few needed a few additional word smithing tweaks, which we discussed at our meeting this evening. Um, but on, um, but I, can, I can say now that everything in the draft that I will point out to you tonight will be uh, where we have agreement. Um, there are no disagreements. There, are, there is some further work yet to be done, but I will, I will come back to that further work yet to be done and how to address it. So on that procedural um, recap, are there any questions from Council? I have uh, kind of a fundamental question. Mm -hmm. First of all, given the timeliness of this, um, delivered kind of late in the day, and I work till 6 p.m., I have not had a time to review it and adequately vet it. So that's a concern, number one. Number two, I am concerned that we have just four people with the absence of Councilman Matthews and obviously Schaefer and uh, Sawyer. So I just want to entertain the notion that and discuss whether this is the appropriate night to push this thing through based on those two variables. Well, as, as you know, I, I kind of had the same feelings. Um, Ken will never be um, available to vote because he's recused himself. Um, one issue could be in, in favor of peak internet, if at all possible, um, because they have, uh, they have a number of, of issues. They have a, a number of things that they're waiting for approval for from us, permits. Um, I'm sure they would like to move forward on. Um, we kind of indicated we'd like to do it today, but you certainly have a great point, so we'll have to make that decision. What do you guys think? Bob? Yeah, I mean, I don't like saying things at the last minute either, and that was one of my objections last week. But the difference last week is there was a lot of things that still needed to be resolved for the two, two sides. People hadn't had time, those of directly involved in the case, to to meet and negotiate, which sounds like you've done pretty successfully. Tonight, you've got the, the, ma the major parties, ha you know, ha having come to a, con you know, cl 
close conclusion, we'll find out what's still missing and whether or not we can put those things off to a different thing, approve what's the progress to date, hopefully, and then put off the other things, perhaps. But, um, you know, so long as our city attorney's happy and their attorney's happy, uh, you know, I'm, I'm inclined to, to give the benefit of doubt on those things where, where progress has been made to date. Uh, so that's a my question opinion. for staff. If, in fact, we do put this off, um, could we allow them to introduce the permits that they're waiting on if, in fact, it comes to that? Would that be a possibility, or would you prefer that that not be the case? We would prefer that that not be the case simply because these ordinances outline the things that need to be included. Um, I respect okay. Councilman Mella's thoughts on this, and my only request would be if you're leaning towards not doing that, uh, not moving forward, let's cease work very quickly. Right. Yes. We've got a lot of folks in the audience who came just for this. Okay. Uh, we believe, however, that we have, uh, as Councilman Carlson said, addressed all the major issues, and we are doing some fine-tuning, some very small fine-tuning, uh, and in agreement with uh, both uh, Peak Internet and their council. Uh, so it would be our uh, recommendation that we move forward so that we don't hold them up. They have multiple permits that they're waiting on until this is resolved so they can get some last minute work done before winter sets in. But it's certainly council's decision. Carol? Well, I, I would like to have Aaron go through the, the major changes and then make a decision if that's, if, if sure. that's acceptable to Bill. Yeah, the only caveat is that uh, I would just say two things. One, uh, irrespective of the fact that both councils approve of the changes, uh, to me is okay. is immaterial, and uh, I need to make an independent judgment. And secondly, if you know we're willing to go through that forbearance of going through it, I you know won't be able to guarantee that I can, because it's it's so newly there are a lot of red lines in this document, and so it I respect peaks level of urgency given the history, but uh, given the gravity of these changes and the serious implications downstream for not just PEAK, but every other entity that seeks access to the right of ways, uh, I would just reserve the right to take a much more deliberative approach. I, I agree, but it, yeah, as, we're here. as a staff report, I would like to hear yeah. what, uh, what has transpired fine. in the last two weeks. Uh, two weeks ago, it didn't seem to be too urgent to peak, but evidently right. it is tonight. So with that caveat, I'm fine. Okay. Good. Yes, let, let's do that. And I think that the, the changes can be um, addressed um, as, um, you know, as substantive changes as we go through them. And um, I, we will start with page four of the administrative regulations. And what you will see deleted is 3.3.1C. And that was a deletion based on a rethinking of how to define a uh, the work under a permit or the work limits under a permit. The um, previous paradigm had a uh, 1,000 uh, linear feet work area. And when we sat down with Peak, we, we discussed that um, it was probably simpler to just go with a 5,000 feet work limit. And so it did away with the need to worry about 100 feet in between 1,000 foot work areas. So it's just, it just um, we simplified with a, a new construct for what was going to be the work site under a paradigm. And this is superfluous at this point. Aaron, can I interrupt just for a yes. second? Has any other of our franchise providers had an opportunity to look at this uh, new draft? Um, this was on the website, and we did not receive any other comments. The only other comments we received from anybody besides Peak were from CenturyLink, and we got those comments on September 30th. And they were they were minor, and we made, essentially made those changes our walk council through that on October 1st. Does that satisfy our obligation? Absolutely. It's legislation. Thank you. 
the um, the changes on page six are, um, while they look like a number of bullets have been added, they all are grouped under the heading of what needs to be contained within the pre-work sketch plan that is submitted by the permit applicant that hadn't been very well defined. And so working with PEAK, we have um, defined that now. Um, the purpose is to make sure that um, the, city, the city has something that allows the city to understand where the um, permit holder is going to be working, what direction they're going, and um, something more than a uh, pictorial on the back of a napkin. So we move forward with this. I would point out that with regard to the fine tuning that was done at the 615 meeting this afternoon, the first bullet is going to be reworked. Actually, the first bullet is going to be removed. And so I would ask that council pass this the way it is, and we will bring you a amendment, a first amendment of this that will include these various fixes. Because, and I will tell you why. Uh, first off, uh, this was um, sent to the pub publisher yesterday, which it always is when we can advance. And it is going to, it's set for publication next Wednesday in the form that it, you see it in front of you, with the, with the red lining in front of you. Um, it's $630 every time we republish this. And so rather than make changes tonight so that we have to republish it in a further, yet a further week away from, um, a further two weeks from tonight, we will just simply bring you a discrete First Amendment that will eliminate the first bullet and address some of the other fine-tuning that I'll bring up tonight. And we have full agreement from uh, Peak that they were comfortable with that approach. So again, while there may be a number of bullets, they are captured under the same, um, the same purpose, and that is to provide enough information on a construction plan or a sketch plan so that um, city staff knows what, it is they're per what work it is they're permitting. Page 363, that was a request made specifically by PEAK to add some language that the city will do its best to um, act on completed permit applications in a reasonable time period. And we are comfortable with that. PEAK uh, is comfortable with that. They told us that this evening, although they did raise it in their 330 comments, they did tell us this evening that they are comfortable with this now. There was some confusion as to exactly what the 5% um, amending the permit so that uh, permit quantity increases by more than 5% um, or that under 5% could be included in the existing permit. And um, as we walked through it and talked through it with Peak, but it, it wasn't that helpful to them. It was in there with the intent of being helpful to someone who held the permit. Um, they felt that that wasn't especially helpful, and the fact that we had changed the um, work site under a permit from 1,000 feet to 5,000 feet, it no longer was a, um, considered an issue. With respect to uh, the change at the end of 3.9.1, um, that was also added um, as a uh, response to Peak's request to make sure that there was this notion of allowing design engineering followed by construction, um, that you could include that into a permit, and that there would then be a, um, a permit amendment fee that would attach to that. Um, the permit amendment fee you'll see is recommended and presented for council in Resolution 796 to be $55. So you'll see that later. Uh, I would also point out that we discussed as a fine-tuning measure this evening, um, just to make it clear that the permit amendment isn't only a lot, isn't only um, permitted in order to uh, address a phasing, but there may be other times when a permit amendment would be allowed. <coughs> the permit amendment fee is now attached to the permit extension provision, so again that's 50 proposed and recommended for council to be $55. 
Section 3.12 is one of those fine-tuning sections that we'll address in the later amendment, but we are recommending that we uh, change the time, the advance notice that must be given by any permit holder for a final inspection from a strict 24 hours to within one working day. So that... Oh, that excuse me, that's not redlined in my... That's not redlined. And that just happened today at the 615 meeting. So that will... take that, please. Yes. So when that will come... Okay. So that will come back to council as an amendment. It's not presented to you to approve tonight. What's the change, though? The change would be to substitute A in the second line, substitute A minimum of 24 hours to within one working day. Thank you. Thank you. The next change is on page 10, section 4.12. We up to five locations, again, goes away because we have a different uh, way of looking at the work site under a permit. Can I ask a question? Yes. Um, changing that to 5,000 linear feet, square feet, what does that mean? It's linear feet, and I will let the city engineer follow up on that answer, please. Our original concept for the permit allowed five locations for linear type construction, which is typically trenching or directional boring, to have five locations of up to 1,000 feet. So rather than having five discrete locations or up to five discrete locations, we said, okay, let's just, we'll allow a permit for up to 5,000 linear feet of trenching or directional boring. And it's a cumulative 5,000 feet. So it could be disjointed. It doesn't have to necessarily be continuous, but it'll be cumulative distance. How much distance then would you allow between between the trenching, if it's a trenching operation or any other type, so if it's cumulative, cumulative over the city? Cumulative? Yes, over the city. So you could have, let's say, a location down by Safeway of a thousand feet, and a location over by Meadowwood Park of a thousand feet for a total cumulative distance of two thousand feet or so. Uh, and that could be covered under one permit, and it would be adequately depicted on the sketch plan or construction drawing, so we know exactly where that is. Does that make sense? Thank and you. And the intent for that was to provide maximum flexibility to whoever might be doing this work, but yet still give us the full information we need to know where they're doing the work. Well, then the question is, if they don't, knowing that they have a cumulative uh, allowance in one permit for 5,000 feet, you would assume then that they would provide the sketch maps for every location. Correct. And if they did not and came back and said, well, it's going to be in my my total cumulative authority of 5,000 feet. They would have the ability to do an amendment to the permit. Okay. okay. Follow up, uh, Aaron and Bill. How is that number determined? Is there any kind of guidance with respect to other municipalities? Was it a purely negotiated figure? Can anyone answer that? Well, it was uh, two things. It was a carryover from our original ISP permit process, which allowed five locations. And how many feet? We didn't specify a linear length in the original permit. So we did look at other municipalities and what their constraints were. And since we had the original permit of the original revised new permit of five locations, we just kept it to be consistent. So it's a carryover from the previous permit system plus our research with other entities. So there was some guidance. And it's measured, it's measured linearly along that linear feature. And it was non-contiguous in the guidance? I'm not sure. 5,000 feet did not have to be <coughs> one piece. It was non-contiguous sections to be determined by the vendor, the entity doing the work. It does not need to be contiguous. But the guidance directed that, or you determined it? We determined that in this part of this revised permit. Thank you. You're using the term guidance or precedence. Well, precedence, some other. Municipality. Yeah, exactly. Your research 
directed, I'm trying to get a sense whether we're being consistent or inconsistent with prevailing municipal standards. Well, there's a lot of different standards out there. Uh, we, we research local standards up in Centennial. We went as far as Kansas uh, and looked at many different ones, and each one has a different standard, quite honestly. So we developed what we thought was manageable for us, for our staff, for what we thought would be fair to those people trying to get a permit. But let me also bring out and point out that this is a uh, permit to, write, to work within the right-of-way. Directional boring and trenching is just one of the many types of operations that this kind of permit also covers. When a contractor wants to come in and dig in the street to um, do a tap, fix a sewer line or something, if it, then they need to get a street cut permit. So we had to cover all of those different what ifs, so to speak. So what we're talking about when we say the cumulative 5,000 feet, that's only for trenching or boring. So in effect, there was not a lot of precedent or guidance that we derived these from. Because you said they were, they were effectively, I'm just trying to paint a picture sure. of to what degree we shadowed what might be perceived reasonable sure. standards. Well, and, and certainly that's what we endeavor to do, but uh, to say that multiple entities have all the same rules and regulations would be inaccurate. Well, I wouldn't say so, all the same, but was there a preponderance of guidance that you took these from? It doesn't sound like there was, but I'm just trying to clarify that. Not in this total length, cumulative distance one, no, sir. Thank you. Let me take counsel then to section 422, plan construction activity. You'll see no changes before you on this. You will see no redlining because we are not recommending that in the ordinance that you approve tonight, you change this. However, we will be requesting a change in the proposed First Amendment that we will bring to you, and that would be to this section 422. And let me walk you through what that change will be. The change will be in the third line, at the end of the third line, to substitute a minimum of 24 hours and replace that within one working day. Are you in subsection A? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm in section 4.2.2 on page 12. Thank you. So the change will be in the third line and it will be to substitute a minimum of 24 hours to within one working day. And the other change that we would be recommending to you in the form of a uh, First Amendment would be to delete the last sentence, which now reads a notice of violation may be cha charged to the permit holder if its contractor cancels a scheduled inspection or changes the work schedule without providing a minimum of four hours advance notice. Why did you delete that? That seemed impractical in uh, with respect to how the city currently operates. The next change, I'll bring council to page 13, section 4.2.5. This captures the um, change in the concept of how the limits uh, of the work under the permit were de defined and described as the city engineer just explained. I will take, that takes me to page 17, and uh, sub H on page 17 is the next section, 5.2.1 sub H. And this was a discussion on how to um, get around a concern on the part of the city that steel plates can pr uh, present a hazard uh, and how to uh, have some flexibility uh, with regard to when they are permitted. And so that has been captured in that new sub H. And the designated representative could be someone from Public Works? Yes, the designated representative is one of four persons. It is the city engineer, the city utilities director, the city construction inspector, the city manager, and the city manager has the ability to uh, designate a person in, in the absence of any of those people. That way the work continues to be administered.
The next change is on the bottom of page 22 with section 5.2.9. It became clear that um, the sketch plan um, would have some limited amount of information. So at the pre-work stage, at submitting an application, so much work would, so much information would have to be provided in the form of construction plans or a sketch plan. And it was also recognized that all would benefit from an as-built turned in at the end of the work. So that uh, any person who, who obtains a permit and works in the right-of-way is required to submit a sketch plan and these are the specifications for the sketch plan to be submitted. That didn't really change what was there in concept, but it did um, bolster and, and, and make, um, uh, add a few more specifications so that um, we were getting a meaningful as-built at the end of the process. And I would add that we try to be consistent with our engineering specifications as to the requirements of Our what goes on in as-built. Uh, a road smoothing of the second to the last bullet was requested, and uh, we would be bringing that to you again in the First Amendment, and that second to the last bullet is all utilities or other infrastructure. The requested change that we would be recommending to you would be to change all to located utilities or other infrastructure. So the word all would be recommended, we would recommend a change to located. So that alleviates the permit applicant from locating everything that may be vulnerable well, to the, the boring operations in right. particular. Well, it doesn't because the provider and the owner of a utility is required to, prov to do the locating. So the locating is going to be done by the provider or the, or the, the utility <coughs> owner. So as that provider, be it Black Hills or IREA, um, pr locates utilities, then those located utilities are what need to show up in the as-built plan. So there can't be anything outside that scope. <coughs> outside the scope of located is in effect covering everything that would reflect all. It's just it's defined by the fact that they've located it. Well, what it, yeah. what it doesn't cover is a... Um, would be something that hadn't been located. So it could be working there, though. Right, right. So what our concern was, again, I have to go back to the concern was the um, the private sanitary sewer lines, which are at a right angle to the crossing conduit that's being bored um, underground. In the case of those crossing utilities, those are in the fourth bullet up those have to show up on the as-built. So what we did, and recall last time in the October 1st meeting, what, what we had done was we had taken away the obligation to locate those prior to submitting an application, but to show those now on the as-built because that, that person working in the right-of-way crosses those and so learns their location. So those show up now in the as-built. And that was really some of the, the flexibility that um, we felt was, was um, uh, something that would get city where it needed to be because an as-built plan was now going to show that added information. Yes. A question for Public Works. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any t intention in the future to go from paper copies of all of these various as-built drawings from the various utility providers to going to a, a GPS uh, source where you just go click and you know exactly what's in any particular area of town that any new uh, utility provider would have to know that those are there. I mean, are we going to make use of this in something more of a useful environment? Are you suggesting some additions to the budget? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the short answer is yes. The timeline on that? No, Not anytime soon. Well, it all depends on how much we can afford in the budget. But we do have $200,000 a year in the budget for IT, so maybe part of that could take care of that. Okay. okay. And then the final change 
is uh, really something in the nature of housekeeping and cleanup. And that was to take um, and delete the first two sentences of 5 to 10, um, which we had already uh, brought to you in our October 1st meeting, the notion that well, what we had changed from the original version to the October 1st version was the uh, obligation for the permit holder to locate the private sanitary sewer lines before um, working at the application stage. And as we noted uh, in our October 1st presentation, that has now changed. Uh, what was added in place of it were some um, uh, provisions that would um, uh, add to enforcement. And so that's when the explicit provision on the jail time as a possibility for violation was added. So the bottom line on those changes that were not included in our version tonight really had to do with changing 24 hours, in some cases, to within one working day? That, 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 can, that was, uh, would constitute two of them. They weren't, you know, they weren't anything that was um, significant. And then or, or, or changing or material, changing the characterization mm -hmm. of all utilities to right. locate yes. utilities on page 23. And, and I could run through those just if council would like. You will again. We'll see those again in the form of the first amendment. So if you'd like me to run through them now, again I can. If not, uh, we'll present them to you in the first amendment. Well, I'm sorry, I was reading this. I'm trying to get you to say it again, please. Um, I, I would be happy to run through the fine tuning that was done in the 615 meeting and just make sure that you have a. a, a I think that would be helpful. Okay, I'd be happy to do that. So, first we would turn to 362B2, and again, the first bullet would be we're recommending in the First Amendment that that would be deleted. Pardon? That's on page six. Three, page yeah. six. Two, the first bullet. B. Oh, the plan sheets measuring 24 by 36. The first bullet, location well plan improvements to include dimensions to adjacent oh, utilities and other three. infrastructure. Okay. okay. Yeah. For, first bullet. But you were going to propose new language for that. Nope, it's going to be deleted. deleted. Oh, it's going to be deleted. Okay. Uh, the next change. would be, and I, uh, yeah, let me point this out, it would be in the fourth bullet, and we would have the word visible in front of culverts. Page six, page six, the fourth bullet, we would insert the word visible in front of the word culverts. Oh. In the third line of the third bullet, fourth bullet. But by deleting the first bullet, is that, in a sense, a redundant bullet because yes. the rest of the bullets cover all that same information? That that was that was where we got to. Okay. I mean, is there a difference between visible and invisible <laughs> culverts, or just not distinguished, <laughs> not evident? Is that what you? Okay. It's, there apparently is. You know more than you want to now. David wants to say something. No, he doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking, you know, phantasmagoric culverts. How about that? Uh, 3.9 on page 7. We, we haven't uh, added, we haven't written the language yet, but again, that was the concept that more than just a phasing was allowed for a permit amendment. And so, for instance, if the permit application had come in with 2,000 feet, then upping that to the maximum 5,000 feet by permit amendment was something that would be absolutely allowed. And that is the explicit sort of change we want to make and, and that express that point. It really only occurs when it's a, a linear no, it's, no. wouldn't it be any? Yes. Is that correct? It's linear, the 5,000 feet applies to linear trenching or boring. Cumulative. Cumulative. Non-contiguous. 
Optionally not. But it doesn't have to be an extension at that, a particular trench. Yeah, I think it's at their discretion. Yes. Okay. We just want to know where the work's happening. Very reasonable. And then in 3.12, again, that was replacing a minimum of 24 out on page 9, 3.12. At the top of the page, replacing a minimum of 24 hours in the second line within one working day. And then section 4.22 on page 12. Again, in the third line, replacing a minimum of 24 hours within one working day. And striking the last sentence of section 4.22. And then finally, there was also a fine-tuning change to 5.2.9, sixth bullet. On page 23. Replacing all at the beginning of the sixth bullet, which is second to the last bullet, replacing the word all with located. And I'm just going to turn now to Council for Peak, because um, this was a list of things that I noted, and I just want to get a head nod that I covered all of those. And I see that I got a positive head nod on that, so thank you. That concludes the... Um, the, the changes to the administrative regulations. And I'd be happy to take any questions on those. So 12.51, there's changes. 12.44, there were no changes, correct? Correct. And, and if there 796. are... 7.96. Right. And then I'd be happy to move on to 7.96 if there are no questions. Any questions? There are no changes in 12.44. We're going to move to 7.96 unless you have a question. So the change in 796 was uh, explained to council last week as well, and that was um, instead of a annual automatic 5% increase in the fees that are established by Resolution 796, uh, we would instead and replace that with a increase that would be um, based on inflation and that uh, would then be defined by uh, the annual percentage change in the United States Department of Labor, Bureau of Labor Statistics, Consumer Price Index, for the Denver Builder, all items, all urban consumers, or its successor index. Um, that would, that increase would happen annually on May 1st because anyone who has ever tried to find that information any earlier in the year knows that you cannot find it for all four quarters until more like March or April. And that um, summary then of the fees, the other change that you'll see to the fees themselves. Is um, that we've added the permit amendment fee, which is $55. And how is that arrived at? The rationale for that permit amendment fee is contained in the box to the right. As you know, all fees have to have a rational relationship to the, the true administrative costs. And you'll see that what um, the city has staff has provided are the actual administrative costs. So it'll be, yes. Um, the actual, and we can certainly provide council with an enlargement of this. And my apologies that it is not on the dais in front of you. Um, but you can see that the time, cost per hour, um, are figured for the uh, personnel who would do the work associated with administering those permit amendments. And that uh, comes out to $55.25. It's essentially rounded down and recommended to you to be $55. You will see that the other permit fees have not changed from what you saw um, going back um, to October 1st. Those remain the same. You see that there is a $150 permit fee, base permit fee. There's a reinspection fee of $30 per hour. And then you'll see that there is also a table that 
uh, provide you with the rationale for the notice of violation charges. Those are start out at $100, excuse me, they start out at $250, and they are subject to increase $50 for each subsequent notice of violation. And are those also tied to the CPI? They are not. That is those would have to come back to council. Okay. I'm sorry. Yes, they are. Yeah. Uh, you're saying that do the, do the notice of violation binds uh, penalties as well? Yes. Yeah, those, would, those would be subject to it as well. Okay. And it could go down. And they could go down. As, as expressed in the form of the resolution, the adjustment could be up or down. Ms. Scott, are we good with everything there? I'm sorry, please, if, you, if there's something that I needed to address, please come and let me know. In the meantime, point of information, is that the same index we use when we calculate the inflation for our city budget? Yes. Denver Boulder CP. Correct. And that's the 1 May date. The general time point. <laughs> Typically. Thank you. Um, so that takes us to the substantive walkthrough. And I'd be happy to answer any questions because my final uh, part three of this presentation is my recommendation to council. And if there are no questions, I'll move on to that. Phil, you've been with us at least on this. you have any questions? No. Phil? No. no. Okay. Okay, again, it will be, um, I've walked through the, the substantive changes to the administrative regulations cont contained in Ordinance 1251 and also those contained in Resolution 796. Ordinance 1244 um, had, has no changes because we have not received a single comment on it from the first uh, form of it being published. My recommendation would be that uh, Council pass all of these tonight. And that is because, with the exception of the possibility of jail time, um, and then the, the wordsmithing of the fine-tuning that we did at 6.15 today, um, the, um, and that would be jail time for violating the administrative regulations. So the possibility of jail time for violating the administrative regulations is really the only outstanding issue, other than some of those wordsmithing issues, with Ordinance 1244, uh, with Ordinance 1251, and there are no issues with 1244, and there are no issues with Resolution 796, raised by comments received from, from anybody, including Peak or CenturyLink or anyone else. So here's our recommendation for de dealing with the jail time issue as well as the, those fine-tuning issues. First off, the reason for the jail provision is to ensure compliance. Past history has shown that uh, compliance can be difficult to achieve, and issues of non-compliance, such as lack of revegetation, improper patching, exposed cable, cable not buried at the proper depth, depth, linger and become costly problems for the city and its residents. Having said that, if we can achieve commitments for compliance on current outstanding issues, which we believe we can, and uh, have the added enforcement tool of a fine that is up to the current statutory amount, which would be $2,650, plus an annual adjustment for inflation, which is what statute allows a um, municipality to, um, to, as a maximum level for their fines, we believe that we can then bring to you a First Amendment that would recommend doing away with the possibility of jail time for the violations of the administrative regulations. It would, as I also mentioned, bring to you those other minor uh, wordsmithing, fine-tuning issues that we discussed earlier tonight. So we believe that you can separate that out and deal with it um, in a First Amendment, which we would bring to you after we have the meetings on the compliance. Um, and we believe that we could have that meeting in the next week or two. And so that we could bring back to you in November a, a simple, discreet First Amendment that would address, um, that would do away with the jail time and would address these other uh, five or six fine-tuning issues. Is there an associated increase in fine if we remove the jail, the jail term? That's what we would be recommending. And what was that amount again? It's currently $2,650. Mm -hmm. 
and it does allow, and uh, it would be written to pay it what state law allows, which is an annual increase um, adjusted by inflation, which would be the same definition that we had in our fee resolution. And is that per infraction, or is it? That's an that's an up to on a conviction. If you were if you happen to be convicted of a violation then that would be the maximum amount that the municipal judge would be able to fine you. So it's a, it's a maximum amount per conviction on an infraction. And each infraction is a separate offense. That's what I was getting at. Thank you. And Aaron, could you inform us about, in general, are jail sentences imposed for violations of administrative ordinances? I would say it, it's, it varies across the board. Um, I would say that in um, um, the city of Centennial, which is the um, uh, template that we worked with and talked to folks there, um, they rely just on an administrative enforcement procedure um, with it for their notice of violations. Although their notice of violation amounts are quite a bit, I can't tell you what they are right now, but they're quite a bit more than $250. Um, the, it varies from city to city. Um, it is, um, remember that the starting place for us was 12.04 of our existing code. 12.04 is our work in the right of way regulations and they're very pared down and those do carry with them, any violation of those do carry with them um, the criminal penalties of up to $300 or um, 90 days in jail or both. So this would be a departure from 1204? It would be. Okay. Um, one other question, though, on 1244, um, section 1204.7, fees, charges, and administrative penalties, that still contains the um, modification of 5% not to exceed 5%, would we need to? Yes, we would need to change that. that to the CPI? Yeah, and we could do that. We could do that. I, my recommendation there, would, that would um, be, that would pair it exactly what is contained in 796, Resolution 796. <coughs> so we would strike that first, we would strike the first sentence which begins a long sentence, and it begins on the bottom of page four, and it carries over to the top of page five. Yep. And it would um, then be replaced with a sentence that would read, the fees and charges established by Resolution 796 shall be automatically adjusted, or shall be adjusted annually, and I'm sorry, the word automatically shall be taken out of there. Shall be adjusted, well, no, it does stay. It automatic stays. Shall be automatically adjusted annually, up or down, by inflation, beginning May 1, 2016, and every May 1st thereafter. And then goes on to de define what inflation means within the meaning of the of the ordinance 1244. So again, we would eliminate and we would delete the first sentence on the bottom of page four under section 12.04.70 of, of ordinance 1244 and we would replace it with the sentence that I just recited. Uh, revisiting the enforcement mechanism. Do we feel that this has enough sufficient teeth? Um, typically, behavior is conditioned by adequate and proportionate enforcement. Um, is anyone else on council thinking that this may not be adequate, that it may be a little less than adequate based on the potential violations? 
Okay. Just a thought. Um, I, I do not, <coughs> because this is an administrative regulation. I'd rather us focus on increasing the uh, potential imprisonment time for traffic uh, violations than I would for rights of way. I, and that's not to, to uh, diminish how important it is to protect the right of way. I just think it's more realistic to use, get them in the pocketbook, than send somebody to sit in the county jail. Yeah, I agree with Carol. I was going to just commend the council and all the parties involved. Um, I like that approach better myself. I, I know what you're saying, Phil. Um, jail term for this um, seems a little excessive to me. Hopefully at the end of the day we get, um, you know, we, we get great cooperation by all parties um, in this regard. And, and um, I kind of I, I tend to agree with Carol. I'm glad we're headed in that direction myself. I like that direction anyway if we do go that direction. I agree. And as is pointed out, I mean, it's not working. You always have the opportunity to impose jail time at a later time. If, if you were to adopt the First Amendment and, and, and do away with it, you can always amend an ordinance later if that were the case. Any other questions? We're in a period of public comment, so we can get that comment, too. Um, Phil, you have any sense on how we should move forward now that you know some of these changes? Change of mind. I mean, I'll be candid from a just a ideal perspective. Uh, it's unfortunate that obviously Ken has justification. But it's unfortunate we don't have a fuller because I think when you have the to me the severity, importance, gravity, and implications are should be commensurate with the robustness of representation, and we're at obviously a deficit in that regard. So it's. You need four votes. We have to have everyone here in complete agreement. So it's a little bit, uh, it's not ideal. It's well, may I ask that question, too? It's a, a procedural question. If, if we were not to have four votes in favor or against, what is the next step? Do we go to a second council meeting? That's a good question. Do we need four yes votes? Yeah. Four affirmative? Yeah. Four affirmative. Yes, the charter requires four affirmative votes in order to adopt an ordinance. Um, so, four yes votes. And what if, if it's voted down or it doesn't achieve the vote? Then there is no, um, no, um, nothing that would prevent it from coming back in front of That's council at a later time. You can always revisit it. Yeah. yeah. Well, Council, before we go any further, we need to make a decision. Yeah. Or do we need, still need to have public comment, or do we have to make the decision whether we're going to move forward? Well, if we don't move forward, I don't know if we need public mm -hmm. comment now. What, yeah. what do you think? Yeah, I, I don't think the Council is bound to take any public comment, because I think you, you close the public comment portion of the hearing by tabling final action. So you essentially close the, the public hearing portion. That was last time we had the public mm -hmm. hearing. So we can entertain a motion at this point to table or to uh, approve the recommendation of the council. Yes. Oh, I did want to address the number of people. Uh, I agree with you. That, you know, we should, on a major decision, we probably should have most council members here, or I'd say all. But I recall when we passed the vote on marijuana, whether we would permit sales in this town, we only had five people here, and the vote was three to two. You know, that would be one that would be open for revisiting in the light of that the small number and the very close vote. Another two people might have thrown it the other direction. So, but we don't want to we don't want to revisit that. I'm just saying that that principle hasn't always been followed uh, by council. No, it, it, it's been variable. When I was on council in the you know, last decade, we had there were a couple of votes that were, uh, in my estimation, not ideal, and we only had four people. And I mean, this is a legislative matter. It, there's nothing secret or, or hidden about your vote. I mean, if one of you is inclined to, to vote against, um, and that is, you know, made clear, then I think you know you can you can weigh that and decide decide how you want to move forward. You can take a, a straw vote before we have your actual vote, 
you can, you can approach it however you want if you want to gain that kind of information. There's nothing that prevents that. That's a good point. And I should also point out while you're not bound to take any public comment, there wouldn't be anything to prevent you Perhaps from taking it. Thank you. Mr. Miller, I'm going to defer to you. I'll say this. I, I tend to agree with you, Phil. Um, I thought about this most of the day today, and it is a big decision, Bob. Um, and we could make the decision today, and it may or may not change. Um, I'm not real comfortable with four of us deciding on this. I like your big picture approach. This doesn't have to be done in two weeks. I mean, we can do it in two weeks, and and everyone might not be as happy, but I want to make sure we get it right with the right people here, and I think that's really important. So I would tend to lean in your direction. Okay. Bob? My only proposal for a compromise, and if we don't make the decision tonight, would be that, that uh, the urgent permits be allowed to proceed so that they they can lay some more cable before the winter sets in, and and I, I think that's a pragmatic decision. We leave it up to the public works department how much they're willing to to give on that. I mean, to allow it to go forward. Um, so that that's what I would propose. I, I would disagree with that. I think uh, we have a lot of work in this. We're talking about a two-week difference. Three weeks actually. Three, right? So I mean. I just take a different position. I don't think it should be left at the discretion of staff. I think it's too profound to change. Okay. Well, my, my concern is that the, if we table this to the next uh, council meeting, um, the returning two council members may or may not be here at the next meeting as well. It's always a risk. But they're, the same presentation will not be available to them. We'll simply be bringing it to a vote. Well, no, but there are I mean, two or three weeks. I, I was absent the last meeting, but I watched the entire. Uh, they can watch the entire proceeding tonight, and I think it's incumbent upon them to do that, to make a full as full a representation of the proceeding as possible. So that's part of the charge, I think. So they really wouldn't. They would miss perhaps an opportunity. Obviously, they weren't here, but they'd get the next best approximation of that. I, I'm inclined to vote on it tonight, but if I'm the only one who's willing to do that, then I will yeah. refrain. Yeah, I think that the changes that we're going to see at the next meeting are very inconsequential, very minor editing, and uh, I'm, I'm prepared to vote on it tonight, too. Okay, then we'll call for a motion and we'll have a vote. I move to a do we go with the first two or one at a time? Or or three to or I would recommend that you, you need three separate votes. And so I think you should start with Ordinance 1244. And then you would take 1251, and then you would take Resolution 796. Okay. So. Well, I move to approve Ordinance Number 1244, amending Title 12. With these amendments. With, with these amendments as discussed, as presented by uh, our city attorney. Um, Second. Suzanne? Harvey? Yes. Levy? No. Matthew? Oops, pardon me. Mella? No. Carlson? Yes. Two vote is 2-2. Two, two. Motion does not carry. If that's the case, yeah. we can entertain a motion to table all three until our next meeting. Can we, though? We've just voted down one of well, them. Well, we have no, it. No, no, You didn't I, vote it down. Yeah. According Remember, it, it's a tie vote, kicks it to the next meeting. Okay. okay. Is that a reasonable approach? Mm -hmm. Certainly. <clears throat> so I need a motion to table these three. Well, the first one tables automatically. The okay. uh, ordinance, uh, ordinance 1244 will automatically be moved to your next meeting. Should we do the other two individually? Yes, please. Okay. So motion to approve ordinance number 1251 moved to our next meeting, which is November 5th. Second. Suzanne? Levy? Yes. Yes. Carlson? No. Harvey? Uh, yes. 
What the hell? Well, it would, it would be, if we had two no's and two yeses, that means that motion doesn't pass, and therefore it doesn't get deferred to the next meeting. It does get deferred. It does okay. get deferred. Whatever. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. All right. I'll make a motion then to move resolution number 796 and table it until our November 5th meeting. Second. Suzanne? Mello? Yes. Carlson? Abstain. No, that's not you. You can't. Your charter that's doesn't awesome. allow. My question is Your charter doesn't question. allow that. <laughs> One way or the other. Carlson? <laughs> no. Harvey? Yes. Levy? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries three. Thank you very much, Council. I'm going to step away from the dais and just visit with Council for a peek, and so just excuse my absence for a minute. Okay. Um, is Miss Scott here? Um, she's going to visit. She's in the back. Okay, great. Um, Mayor, did you, did you want to address uh, any comments just for to Miss Scott? Minute, if I could. Okay. Before you meet. I just want to say this before you all meet. Um, I applaud um, the effort that both council have worked on for the last couple of weeks and, and come to this decision. I know that it hasn't been easy and it's been a long process. So thanks very much for working with that. And then I'll apologize in a sense. I know people would like to have this completed today. Understand that we're trying to do the right thing, and I think, I hope that you will agree that having a full council makes all the sense in the world. I know we're not guaranteed that everyone's going to be here next week or in three weeks, but typically we'll have at least five or six here. So um, apologies if that's the right word. Um, we're trying to do things the right way, and, and so we'll move forward. Um, again, I appreciate your efforts. Thank you very much. Okay, we will move on to item number 10B and David Butter. That's the budget. That is the budget. We're going to get uh, Councilman Matthews. Thank you. <laughs> Should we take a. Oh, we probably yeah. need to. We'll do that. Okay, let's reconvene at uh, 825. Because it wasn't, it wasn't clear in there, and I asked, can you abstain? And uh, now I have the answer. <laughs> you can voice your voice your discussion. Thanks. Abstain. That was good. I want to revisit marijuana, but. So just so some of my other questions is because it says, you know, the council says, say you're not fine, you know, whatever, over the constitution, I remember, oh, I didn't see that specifically. And 
excuses you're out of town on that trip. Yeah. He says it at the end. I, I sent, I have it on the letter yet. Yeah. 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 When he does his announcements, I don't buy the Gazette. I look at it online, but it was a councilman in the store. One of those Denver and I'm okay. so uh, if it was his mugshot, no, his hair was wild, he, he, he tweeted, he was picked up from DUI, he trashed the jail cell that he put him in, and he was able to excuse him. Right. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. 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 Okay.
Each year we informally title our budgets. We've had years of excitement, years of security, years of caution, years of stability, and years of opportunity. I think an appropriate title for the 2016 budget will be a year of commitment. The council decided in recent years to move forward with three capital projects, the fleet maintenance facility upgrade, the Memorial Park renovation, and the Aquatic Center. The council made that commitment knowing that there would be no room in near-term future budgets for other capital projects, but with a firm commitment to maintaining the high level of services that our citizens have come to expect and that they deserve. With that in mind, your staff is proud to present to you the 2016 budget proposal, a year of commitment. This budget is perhaps the most complex budget that has been produced in some time. While we are fortunate to have many great projects going, we have numerous sources of revenue and numerous expenses that will be occurring over the next few years. You will see that the 2015 year in projected in many cases is vastly different than the 2015 budget. That can all be attributed to revenues and expenses associated with the council approved capital projects. What this also means is that we fine tune costs associated with our projects as we fine tune revenues. We will be making adjustments to both the 2015 year in projected and the 2016 budget. For example, today, the Woodland Aquatic Project received a $200 donation towards the Aquatic Center. That has an impact on our budget. We will be making those adjustments as things are more refined. Generally speaking, normal revenues and expenses are in line with what is normal. While it may appear that we have an abundance of reserve dollars, those reserves will be what pays our debt service for the next few years. We have tried to minimize the confusion and complexity but in case we haven't been successful, we stand by to clarify the presentation. Lastly, this budget presentation will be similar to years past. We will end each fund summary with a calculated fund balance. For the general fund, we have one summary sheet that shows normal operations so that you can do an apples-to-apples -apples year to year comparison, and a second summary sheet that shows the impact of bond and certificate of participation revenue and expenses. In a separate but attached addendum, we will lay out the capital projects, their revenue stream, and their expense stream. The year 2014 ended extremely well financially, and 2015 appears to be heading towards a strong finish as well. Revenues are strong, and the city staff has been diligent in reducing operating costs whenever possible. We have been fortunate so far this year with no major natural disasters and our downtown is as busy as has been seen in a long time. Council's decision to move forward with the three major capital projects is monumental in what it will provide to our citizens. While monumental, it will also be limiting in the flexibility that the city has had in the past to take on smaller projects of opportunity that have also benefited our community. We're expecting a 5% increase in health care costs to maintain a similar level of coverage that we currently have. This increased cost will be shared by the city and by our employees using the same rationale and formula as we've done in past years. The inflation rate that we are using for the 2016 budget is 1.0%, which is down from last year's 2.9%. Our detailed triennial salary survey revealed that on average, our salary ranges are about 5.5% below our comparable and competitor entities. This includes that 1% for inflation. While in years past, we have done our best to follow the recommendations of the salary survey, asking for a 5.5% overall adjustment coupled with some amount for paid for performance is too much for our budget to handle. I am proposing a 4.0 pay increase pool that includes a 2.5% salary adjustment and a 1.5% for merit-based pay-for-performance system. This will help us close that 5.5% gap. For several years, general fund expenditures have been very close to general fund revenues, primarily due to capital projects that Council agreed were beneficial, utilizing our reserve to make up the difference. Expenses have never exceeded revenues plus reserve. 
That is the case again in 2016. Budget year 2015 looks like it will finish strongly. The projected year in sales tax revenues were calculated based on our known unaudited monthly sales tax revenue through August plus a solid estimate of sales tax revenues for September through December. At the end of this of August 2015, we are 9.30% ahead of where we were in August of 2014. As you review the general fund summary, remember I'm showing you what our budget would look like including capital projects. It appears that we have a huge amount of money. Remember that since we have received the proceeds from the bonds and the certificates of participation, we must show those as revenues. For the most part, there are no assigned expenditures associated with those revenues yet. We must, however, maintain that strong balance in order to pay contractors as work progresses and to pay our debt service. Those balance sheets are kept separately from the budget and are available for anyone to review. Our emergency reserve remains at 10% of our operating expenses, as Council has directed. For the street fund, we are fortunate that the 410 fund remains healthy and very useful. We continue to make measured yet significant steps based on scientific approach each year in improving our roadways and associated aspects of our roadways. The water fund continues to be stable. We are taking more aggressive steps to ensure that we have a sufficient augmentation water supply by purchasing additional Twin Lake shares in 2015 and securing additional augmentation water storage capability by pursuing a location for a second reservoir. We anticipate reaching an agreement with the property owner on the second reservoir in 2015, starting design in 2016. In 2015, water paid off 86% of its outstanding debt, and they also repaid the $300,000 loan to the wastewater, placing the fund in a good position for future improvements. We have seen a slight increase in growth and anticipate tap purchases to increase for 2016. The wastewater fund also continues to be stable. We have begun the process of funding and designing the wastewater treatment plant expansion. The schedule improvements will extend the life of the plant for several decades. Currently, we are 15% through the design phase. We anticipate construction for the expansion to start in 2016. This budget, coupled with the comprehensive plan, is the proposed annual work plan and major policy document of the city. It provides funding for services, programs, and projects that can be reasonably accomplished in 2016. The budget is organized by departmental function for ease of review and administration. We believe that this proposed budget sustains our obligation to be good stewards of taxpayer dollars while providing a high level of service delivery. City Council review of this document has been scheduled according to the budget calendar on the next page. After review and consideration, the Council may wish to add or to cancel or modify funded projects or activities prior to their adoption of the Budget Appropriation Ordinance following a public hearing on Thursday, December 3, 2015. Now we'd like to present to you our Budget of Commitment. It's been slightly reorganized, you may have noticed that. Uh, historically, we've placed the summary of each fund immediately behind the budget message. That seemed to be a bit of a confusion. So we now have those summaries immediately in front of the detailed sheets. We'll see how that goes. Um, as in the past, I would suggest that we do a page-by-page -page review of the budget funds that are shown on the list tonight, general fund, etc., and answer questions as we go. Certainly not line by line, but page by page. Seems to have worked well in the past. And if the council would prefer a different approach, if you just want to nod your heads, we'll all go home early. But we're prepared to go page by page, and we'll do whatever you ask us to do. I would ask, however, that uh, if, you're, if you have questions as they relate to our capital projects, let's hold those to the end. Let's have our discussion on the normal O&M things. And then at the end, if you want to talk about the capital projects, we can certainly do that. I do think that the insertion of the capital projects adds a level of complexity that perhaps we can separate and talk O&M and then talk capital projects. Is council okay with that approach? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Then we stand by this evening. 
to visit with you on the general fund, the grant fund, three debt service funds, and the street capital improvement funds. Council will recall that uh, you can at any time during this whole process talk about any fund. We're prepared to talk to you about those tonight. We have a few others that we'll talk to you about on November 5th. If you have questions about the ones we're going to talk about tonight on the 5th, we can bring those up. We can continue that on November 19th and again December 3rd. The care in front of you is to finish the budget process by December 3rd so that we can then cancel, per tradition, the second meeting in December. With that, let's move to the general fund. I apologize that the pages aren't numbered, uh, but we'll go with looking at these uh, in the order that they're in your book. And so we'll go behind the tab 100 and look at the general fund budget summary normal operations. And remember, this is a compilation of the beginning with the fund balance from 2014, the audited number. That's a fixed number in time. It's been proven. We do our projections for 15, and we do our budget proposal for 16, uh, and we'll go from there. What questions do you have about the normal operations budget summary? Excellent. Yes, sir. Yeah, I um, appreciate a lot of what I, my questions on the budget were answered before, you know, by email exchanges and stuff like that. Some weren't necessarily answered, or I needed further clarification. So that's what I'll limit my comments okay. to tonight. Uh, what I didn't do was look at what was missing from, from the budget from pre previous years, for example. And I noted that the, count, the commissioners, the uh, planning commission, did not submit a letter this year, or at least it's not in the budget, and I was wondering what we do. Actually, Sally has that. Uh, we, we refute it. It really had no uh, fiscal impact uh, for the most part. It was a continuation of many of the, Sally, go ahead and just, would you hand it out there, please? A continuation of many of the things that we have uh, programmed already. Uh, so we do have that for you this evening, and we'll make sure that our missing council members get that. So rather than review that tonight, right. I would ask you to set it aside and review it before the next meeting. And if you have questions, reference that. We can discuss it at November 5th meeting. Any other questions on the general fund budget summary normal operation? Uh, one of my general questions had to do with the manpower survey. Yes. And uh, you explained uh, in copies of your email response to me went to the council members. Um, my concern was the way we provide um, a salary, and then how do we reward merit performance, OK? Um, <coughs> I'm familiar with a system where you have a established salary. And then if you do a s exceptional work in a year, you get a bonus for that. I understand from your reply that you don't give bonuses. What you do is up the salary. Correct. From the federal government, of course, that's like a, having a, a merit pay step increase every year. Because what you've been if given, let's say you have a $50,000 salary and you've given a $5,000 bonus or uh, increase in salary, that $5,000 bonus carries forward from their that point forward, not bonus. I mean, or, or that additional Seven. salary. That's correct. In other words, they're, they're re compensated, rewarded, not only for that work, but that reward goes all the way through because their new baseline for any increase would be the new, the, the, the previous year's salary, and, and you're now adding p potentially to that. That's so correct. they've already gotten that five thousand from the year before, and and then, like I said, that's forever. My cons my concern there is is that where are we comparing apples and apples with other cities that may have a different approach where they would have a base salary and then they would compensate with bonuses as opposed to a, 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 a an increase in the salary that would continue to carry on um, uh, because where I would see it skewed is that. If there are certain categories or levels of people or whatever that don't get these uh, salary increases, okay, because of performance, that those categories may then over time 
should be shown as very much further behind the other comp comparable cities, okay? And so it, they're behind because they didn't get the cost of living increase. Uh, they, they only got, uh, a, and, and which is kind of like the merit, I mean, the pay for performance increase. No, no, no it's not. No. Yeah, yeah, that's what I want clarified. Well, okay. I, I, lots of statements. I think I heard two questions. I'm not sure what other municipalities do. Very few uh, do a pay for performance process. Uh, most do a standard percent increase, which is what this city did for a lot of years, uh, where everyone, regardless of performance, received the same increase. We wanted to take that to a higher plane, and we instituted the pay for performance uh, back in 2007, 2008. What, uh, as I tried my best to describe to you in the email, was that the, the, the pay adjustment, the salary adjustment process via the market survey compares black municipalities and competitors, and they identify ranges for a particular grade. What's the minimum? What's the maximum? And it's that range shift that they recommend to us every three years to change with perhaps smaller supplemental changes those off two years. It includes inflation. It includes everything. What, what I'm suggesting for this year specifically is um, based on the fact that a 5.5% salary adjustment that the consultant suggests that I think is too, too onerous for this year's budget, and that a salary adjustment of 2.5% be applied across the board. So that, that helps address inflation, and it helps keeps us, keep us a bit more competitive with our other surrounding municipalities, and that there be a 1.5% discretionary pool for pay for performance. So if we're accomplishing both. We're trying to keep a little bit consistent with how the ranges are moving within the area and with like type cities, plus providing a pool to reward those superior performers. So someone who is not performing well would more than likely still get that that adjustment because we need to apply that pay for adjustment. Or the, the salary catching adjustment. up with the, the range adjustment. That's right. But they won't be catching up as much this year because uh, we're not doing it to the extent that the consultants recommended because I, I, I don't think we can handle that in one year. Um, so I, I, I think it's a, it's a combination of the two things that you're thinking of. Uh -huh. We still want to reward performance, but we don't want our employees to fall way behind our local area. Because there are some studies that say if, if you have too much of a deviation, you're, you're okay. If the deviation is larger, then people start looking for other jobs. If the deviation is even larger, they're going to leave. So we want to we want to keep our good folks here. Yeah. And I certainly agree with that. But when when we have range, the, our appendix to the budget is very end list. It, it basically shows the grades and then the range is the minimum, midpoint, and the maximum. Correct. Uh, so when you're comparing the range, are we going with the midpoint there, that there's a 5%, 5.5%? No, difference? just the range. We would so add, you would look at? Just the, the minimum. Yeah. We add 5 point, at, in this year, we're saying 2.5. Okay. Not the 5.5, 2.5. Right. Adjust the minimum, adjust the maximum. So By the range, same percent? Just shifts. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah, just... Oh, um, the other comment I did make in, in my email to you was was how how is other compensation taken into account? Sure. Uh, for instance, uh, extra leave or, or yeah, we don't time we or, don't do that. When an employee comes in based on their uh, longevity or where they are in their career, mm -hmm. we'll look at um, additional uh, starting off at a different place mm -hmm. in our program for for leave. Uh, we have two employees that have vehicles included in their package. Uh, those two employees have uh, a multitude of meetings away from City Hall. We yeah. thought that that was a reasonable thing to do. But if I look at their salaries compared to like positions, they're less. So yeah. they, get, they get to take advantage of that vehicle. Yeah, so when you set the, the salary compensation, you take into account these other absolute benefits. And that was my other question, is when we're comparing the range of salary benefits, do the other cities add in you know, these other compensation forms, no. like life insurance and health insurance? No. it's you know. strictly salary. It's just salary. That's correct. So, for instance, in the case where 
we have two, those two employees that are getting a vehicle. Right. It's just their salary that's been being compared sure. to. But you could say, hey, if you throw in that vehicle, they're already up here. Okay. Well, that's what I handle. Each, I, I look at each of those individually. Okay. That's good. Thank you. Good, yes, sir. Okay, just to follow up, maybe. Uh, what if the 2.5 percent, if that's across the board, what if you have people um, who are, op, you know, performing at kind of a suboptimal, the proverbial needs improvement right. category? Um, is it equitable to give them the two percent, two and a half percent, two, or how does that work? Not necessarily, and as I mentioned in the, the um, I think I use language such as the majority will receive that okay. range adjustment, but that's a discretionary decision that I work on with the department heads. Great, thanks, sir. Because when we take take a look at that last page, uh, you're upping the, the minimum and the maximum. Yeah. But that doesn't necessarily touch anybody that's in that range. But what we do is we adjust everyone's salary. Okay, so if we, we go up by two and a half. That's right. That's right. Because if you just said not everyone, exception. but it's not everyone. Well, it's discretion. It's only. I want to make sure it's discretionary, right. okay. based on performance. Absolutely. And that's. I was just checking. I assume it was, but right. it's good to say that. If we need to do that to get somebody's attention, we've done that in the past. Very good. Yes, ma'am. I only have one general fund question um, on police operations. Okay, so we're going way back into the back 100. And on uh, 221. Uh, 100, 221, 2219 um, miscellaneous uh, police supplies. Will that include body cameras? Uh, Officer Martinez has done an excellent job with some grant work. Um, we have five cameras, and we just received another eight cameras from the state, so we're currently sitting at 13 cameras that we do actually use and are in service. So that will not include any additional cameras. We have enough to cover all officers that are on duty. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions on the general fund budget summary normal operations? Just quick, do we need to increase the expenses for mayor and council based on kind of the overage this year? Did you it, just, would just be okay it? if we, when we, I'm trying to do page by page. You got it. And we'll, we'll get to those pages. You betcha. But I'm happy to jump ahead if you are. No, no, that's fine. Go ahead. Uh, any questions on the next page? General fund budget summary, including capital projects. Understand that's where we just rolled in the revenues from the COPs and the bonds, mm -hmm. so those numbers look huge, but they're going to be spent down. Sir? Yeah, and, and when you mix these kind of monies with our general annual revenues, it my, my suggestion was to break them out because those are untouchable. Those are for those projects. Sure. Uh, and so that we would see of the normal general fund, mm -hmm. how much would be available if we had an overrun of any of these projects, or for additional projects or whatever. In other words, once we've covered our our O and M expenses, uh, and the, uh, how how much do we have available for capital projects? Sure. If you look at if you go back a page, general fund budget summary normal operations. About halfway down, it says 2016 net adjusted revenues over under expenditures. Uh, that's at 543 512. So that's money that could be used towards capital projects. What I can tell you is that if you flip the page, you'll see that that reverses. We now have a negative balance. And that's because we are going to end up uh, spending more in the budgeted expenditures, primarily because we're doing debt service. So we have taken that into account. I mean, if, if the question is, are we going to be able to, are we going to utilize every free dollar for the capital projects, the aquatic center? The answer is yes. We're going to make sure that we maintain our o &M. We're going to make sure that we have a sufficient reserve. We're going to pay our debts, and we will use then residual monies to make sure that we get the aquatic center that folks want here. <clears throat> yes, sir. But in that regard, um, we've got some projects like the fleet maintenance that is finishing up momentarily. Right. 
And if there's residual funds there. In other words, we have a huge contingency on there. And much of that has been eaten up with the asbestos abatement. We also had to reduce some septic or drainage or something. Well, there's been some typical change orders. Right. But still there will be contingency that can be released. I'm not saying that there can be. There could be. Yeah, could be. And if there will be, it will go towards the other capital projects. And then that would be reflected in the final budget that we approve later. I don't know that that will happen because we're not sure that that budget will be done or that project will be done and all the bills paid. But we'll have it as current as we possibly can. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions on that summary? Then let's go to the first page, the general fund revenues. And this one we'll do page by page. If you would identify the particular line number that you're interested in, we'll answer your questions. Okay. Let's get to the second page then, starting with police charges. Any questions on that revenue stream? Either for the 2015 projected or the 2016 budget. So, and, and I do appreciate your explanation of how you arrived at, at uh, the, the sales tax uh, projections and that okay. sort of thing. So I'm satisfied with those. Okay. Then let me flip to the third page. That's miscellaneous revenues. Well, I, I did mention um, traffic fines. We are trying to enforce. We've hired a part-time officer to, to look at 24 and try to issue more speeding tickets, traffic, I mean, red light running tickets. Well, no, I, the, the intent is not to issue more speeding tickets. I, the intent is to enforce the speed limit. Right, right. right. Yeah, and we're, and we are certainly not a city that uh, subsidizes our police force with, with no. uh, fines. I mean, no. It, our, our police budget is $2 million, and I think we collect $35,000 in fines. Even less. Yeah, or even less. So, but the but point is, is that if, if we're trying to make a policy change, that we are now enforcing things a little, uh, especially running red lights, that we, we naturally expect additional revenues in that regard. And, and it, it could be just an initial increase or whatever. It's just the principle of thing. Well, the 20... 15 projected year end was right at a little over 30,000. 2016 budget was 32,000, which I think I said was about a 5% increase. Mm -hmm. Even if we doubled that, said it was a 10% increase, we're talking $1,500. No, but what we you told us before, you've tripled the number of tickets. No, I didn't say that. We've tripled the number of traffic stops. Of traffic stops. In other words, you could give warnings instead of tickets. Sure. We have increased the number of tickets. I won't, I won't, I'm not trying to mislead you. I'm yeah. just trying to make sure that the words that we use are correct. Yeah, sometimes we don't get the sure. distinction. But, but there's also, there's additional expenses, but that's, okay. I just don't think it's worth It's the, not worth finagling. I don't right. think so. Okay. Any other questions on any of the revenues on any of the three pages? Yes, sir. Um, I made a, made a comment under the D DDA budget suggesting that perhaps rather than building up a reserve that every year they... they Could we do DDA okay. and schedule for but, next time? Yeah, right, because but there's on uh, the last page of the line of revenues, you've got the transfer from uh, sure. 215. Right. And, and it's proposed at 36,000. Right. So... We'll take care of that issue under DDA, and sure. if there's an adjustment necessary, we would come back to that page. That's right. Okay. Any other questions on general fund revenues? Okay. Let's go to the first page of expenses, beginning with legislative and administration. Questions there? Your responses to my questions were satisfactory. Good. Then we'll flip to the next page. I'm sorry. I believe it is. It, was it this one for the council expenses? Uh, yeah. We had an overage last in in the current year budget, so I, we talked very tangentially about changing that. The council expense. Uh, it's I'm sorry. It's 
1139.15? Yep, Ryan and Mayer combined. Yeah. Both of them went over. Yes, the, um, yeah, for 2015, the council expense was because we had greater than expected participation yeah. at CML. Uh, we, had all, we had six council members attending. We typically don't plan for that many. Just a, and the mayor's expense is projected to be less than what we budgeted. Okay. But that's in the same realm of it's, it's just a very small amount, two or three thousand sure. dollars. It's not a lot of money. I just wanted to point it out that it was over. Yes, sir. Just as a discussion point. Yep. Anything else on that page? Okay. The next page is municipal court and planning. Well, let's keep clipping along then. Next page is general support and general capital. And we're talking about general capital later? Remember there are so some components of this general capital that are not the capital projects. For example, the first line, which is the a lease agreement that we have for copiers that's a, a, that's an annual yeah. lease well can't we put that on under administration I mean this is a minor amount that really isn't involved in the capital project it's maybe administratively supported let's look at that I, my guess is that in years past the things that we were leasing exceeded that five thousand dollar limit that yeah. declares it to be capital and if we can relocate this to Administration will do that because that's only two thousand, not five thousand. So understand. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> uh, finance next page. Finance and parks, buildings, and grounds. Next page, information systems and economic development. Yeah, uh, I did have a question to that, and you did explain we're replacing, you know, we got some big expenses to replace what we've got in computers and that sort of thing. Um, my concern was how long is this going to go? And you said it could go on for quite a while. Yeah. You know that GIS stuff you were talking about yeah. earlier? That's where this would fall. Well, that's what I was going to propose that we <laughs> included in that. Well, yeah. I understand. That's the right budget area to right. include it. Right. Um, but the budgeted amount that we have there will generally be used by the things that are listed there. I, I will not argue with you that we need to move forward with GIS. We've been treading water. Uh, probably going the wrong way in the current for a while. We have some usable things, but it's certainly not state-of-the-art. It's going to take a huge commitment to get us to that next level. But yeah, if we're talking 200000 a year for the next decade, uh, I don't see, I don't know how long this is going on. That That is something that perhaps could be rolled into to the plans on how to improve our IT system. Into the future it will. Yeah. Because it's some place we need to go. Other questions on that page? Then let's move along to the Cultural Center and Police Ops. Sorry, I jumped ahead to that one. I was just so excited about body cameras. About what? Body cameras. <laughs> well, I was excited to hear the response. Yeah. How much was that grant? We've been able to get a couple of different grants from our DUI funds because we're running a little short, and so it was salary um, savings that we have. So I believe one was around 3000 the other was just under 5000 Nice, Nice job. Uh, in that regard, um, I was assigned as a council liaison to the police uh, committee that decides how to allocate confiscated property or something like that, what revenues we might have gotten from that. We haven't had a meeting in the entire time that I've been there. Uh, for former Chief Bob Larson said, you know, we're getting there. Uh, so just ahead, from my information, is that something that I can anticipate having in my schedule in the near future? Absolutely. It's something we can work on. We have money that's moving around right now because we just received another asset forfeiture. 
for about five thousand dollars. So those those funds are there. They're growing a little bit. Um, the initial thought was to put them towards cameras. I'm going to probably suggest we actually use it towards some kind of a computer um, system that will be able to store all of our data yeah. because that's. Well, I talked to Bob. He said, you know, that that's where we could get money for the cameras. But mm -hmm. when you told me this evening that we have another source for cameras, then. And that kind of takes the pressure off of it. It was an unanticipated windfall, so that's why yeah. we didn't plan for it. Okay. Public Works Administration or Fleet Maintenance? Next page, Street Ops or Parking Rec? Sir. One of my comments we concern Park and Rec, how much that we collect in revenues compared to what we put out in expenses. Mm -hmm. And it's a huge difference. Uh, we are subsidizing Parks and Rec at a rate of like 70 or 80 percent, I mean, a big number. <coughs> and my proposal in there was that since um, the, the county really doesn't have a Parks and Rec department, we and we we provide these services for county residents, not not in addition to city residents. Uh, maybe they might take into account that hey, maybe we could do a pro rate share based on the number of county kids versus the city kids, uh, and cover some of that overhead. Uh, and I'm proposing something in the order of like a hundred thousand a year that the county would pay for their their kids to participate in our park and rec programs. Uh, I, have, I have that same concern with the, the dog catcher, okay, the, the animal control officer, where we pay them $35,000 a year. But on the other hand, we don't bill them for all of our first responder to all the, these donut holes in town. And we're, you know, we're putting a lot of police officer effort into, you know, do stuff that is ultimately the county's responsibility. And I've talked to both kind of sides on this, and it's kind of a pre quid pro quo. Well, it's pre quid pro quo when it's their, the county's benefit and not to our benefit. They charge us for the dog catcher, but we can't charge them for every time our police officers take care of a county business. Uh, and so uh, I, I think it's time that the, that the county step forward and, and support not only like for instance not charges for dog catchers help maybe out with parks and rec and the school resource officer is another category where that high schools these schools su support the entire northern part of the county's kids and our city is bearing that that burden we're, we're paying for the school resources officers uh, and i'm looking for a little more equity in our relationship with the county on, on meeting expenses that we are in fact providing on behalf for the county. Uh, I, just an idea, I'd like to hear from the philosophical arguments by other members of council, and of course your response too. I mean, I've always liked that idea. We, we talked about it, I remember in 2005 and six, and we didn't, you know, quote, get very far in discussions. Have there been any recent discussions kind of in that respect? I'm going to, um, Cindy Kading's at, uh, actually learning how to run an aquatic center this week, uh, so she's not here, and what I don't know is if there's a tiered structure for the city versus the county kids. I doubt very seriously if Teller County, as an entity, would provide us quid pro quo, because they've got a lot of their county that wouldn't even consider participating in our right. activities, but a fee structure that might uh, assess a bit more for a county kid versus a city kid, that might be an appropriate thing to look at. Kind of like the water usage. That's true. Issue. That's true. Uh, and I do know that in years past that has existed, but I don't know when that went away. Uh, and I don't really know the logic behind when it went away, other than it, it's just an, another administrative issue that we have to manage for mm -hmm. small amounts of money. Yeah. I mean, what's the difference? What What is the fiscal difference that we would charge somebody for being outside of the city limits? Yeah. I understand your point. Uh, let me get the school resource officer issue out of the way. The school, as you recall, 
was going to ultimately pay for one of those. And we're on that sliding scale to get there. Well, we'll buy one, they'll buy one. I thought that only went down to 20%, though, or does it go down all the way? Um, it, it may go to 20%. Okay. I know they would absorb the vast majority of it, and that's been working very, very well. Um, the animal control contract, um, we, get our, we get our money's worth on that. We do respond into some of the donut holes, but Teller County also reciprocates, and they can respond and help us out too. And that, that partnership exists. Uh, so I don't want to try to, to, to monkey with trying to figure out how to recoup some of those costs from a law enforcement perspective. But let me look at the, the, the fee structure. Yeah, yeah okay. not just for the county, but the fee structure for, so. for locals. Maybe we should look at that. Yeah. To recoup. But subsidizing a park and rec program is an absolutely normal thing to do. Yeah, sure, but it's, not to the degree that we are. I mean, how, based on what? Yeah, that's, that would be my question. Based on what other cities subsidize? Well, what do we know? I, I'm just, I've never looked at it. Do you know what Yeah, when we were going through on, on, you know, getting the information on the aquatic center, for instance, what, what, we, we were going to come and ask the council, and it turned out about, about $95,000 a year subsidy for that. And that's like less than 20%. But the normal range is up to 40% that the, the, a city would, would subsidize uh, based on look, uh, looking at all these other cities. Um, so going up to 60% subsidy is way beyond that. That forty. But you were looking at but, aquatic centers. Yeah, do you know that's the case for Parks and Rec? Well, no, the, what happened there is that most other places already have a recreation center. Aquatic center is only a portion of it. Uh, and uh, uh, so, you know, we, had, we took that into account, that we only have half of what most other people have. Uh, but with regard to the aquatic center, um, we, and you, you said this before too, is that since it's being paid for generally out of sales revenues, and the folks of Teller County contribute just as much to the sales revenues as the city residents do, then it wouldn't be fair to charge them in resident versus an out resident like Manitou Springs does, or a lot of other places. And that could have been the same logic that was used for the park and rec fees. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. the folks that are going to take advantage of our park and rec programs are right around our perimeter. Right. Yes. So <laughs> they effectively pay into it. That's right. Yeah, and, and, and that's in that case. But uh, in the parks and rec, is there a similar thing where the, um, uh, it, can you equate it to a, kind of that logic for the aquatic center uh, when when there's such a huge difference in what's being subsidized, for instance. Uh, and uh, But the other thing, too, is that has, you know, the residents of this city pay, in addition to the 12% that everybody else in the town, county pays for, or 12 to 4, it's 14% when you add up the four different line items, uh, we all pay 14, per, uh, 14 mil uh, to the county, okay, which works out, and then we also have 16 mil on top of that that we pay for the city. From the and property tax. From the property tax, yes. And that, that 14 mil that we pay to the county is about $1.3 million a year in, in addition to what we pay to the city. And the question is, what benefits are we getting from the county for that $1.3 million? Wouldn't it be reasonable say okay well out of that 1.3 could you at least give us hundred thousand dollars back uh you know uh in you know kind of offset because i'm not really sure what else they, we get in in return for that that 1.3 million dollar contribution we have our own police force we do our own roads we you know just look at the list of services and we pay for that out of the 16 mil what do we get out of the county and that that's part of the factor too is okay these are like three different things, the school resource officer, the dog catcher, the, uh, the parks and rec subsidy. It's kind of a, maybe we just say, okay, as a ballpark estimate or an annual goodwill contribution uh, towards these expenses, how about 10% of what we give, you know, uh, the, count, the city provides in a way of real property taxes to the county. Some, I mean, I'm, that's kind of the logic is, Okay, can we get at least something back <laughs> from what, what we pay? And they may come back and say, this is all the things we provide for you. And it's much more than 1.3 million. Okay, so again, it's, it's that, 
how is it our relationship to the county now that everybody's getting a little better condition financially in the city is basically been best financial condition for ever since the recession and we picked up a lot of things along the way as kind of okay yeah i know you guys can't afford it but what will so we'll take care of it and this is the time to like relook at that relationship as to maybe we can start looking at some of the things that we could get back from the county in return for all the stuff the money we pay for that anyway i thought i'd raise the subject uh just as okay yeah comment on that in principle i think it, it merits evaluation investigation as a practical matter uh, number one there's not a lot of expense that i think can be shared reasonably number two I see struggles with coming up with algorithms and formulas. Number three, I could see it being kind of a, a political slippery slope where the quid pro quos might work actually against us ultimately, kind of a be careful what you ask for. And, um, and the other thing is, I think we would be better off reaching out to the county to try to find uh, common interests and bridging that relationship with which we all no, to one more, one degree or another, has been somewhat marred in recent years, and uh, I think we have an opportunity. I think with uh, a couple of the people on the commission to make inroads that way, and I think this would, given the, the amount of money to be gained, this would be an, kind of an untoward strategic move that might mar that opportunity to advance shared goals. I appreciate it. Let's do this. Let's stick to the budget today. That will be a later discussion okay. because we have a lot of things to talk about. But there are like three or four different line items in our expense part that if we had looked into this could be affected. And so that's why I brought it up as a philosophical issue at this point. Uh, you know, good. Can, good, okay. That's a point well taken. Yeah, we could have fake sales too. <laughs> so we go to the last page of the general fund. Um, just in the theory, and then the, the recap. Any any comments on that last page? Okay. Any uh, final questions on the general fund? The grant fund. There's just you. I'll, you understand grant funds. It's money in. It's money out. If you got, I don't want to go page by page. I don't think it's worth that time. Uh, but if you do have questions on any of the grants, we're prepared to discuss that. Of course, there's only three. With that, then we're going to move to the debt service funds. I'm going to ask Wally to do those. That's a surprise for him. My voice is running out. He's eminently prepared to talk about the debt service funds. Are we skipped over the DDA? The DDA we'll do next time okay. for the schedule. So we'll go to 330, 340, and 350. And remember, 340 and 350 are the capital projects, right? Okay, so are we also skipping over then the uh, 305 and uh, 330 funds? Yep, we're going to follow the schedule and go from the grant funds to the debt service funds of 330, 340, okay. 350. And then we'll finish it up with the 410 fund, and the others we'll do next time. Okay. Yeah. Okay, going through, I, I will take a page from your playbook, uh, Mr. Buttery. Are there any questions on the uh, 340 fund, which is the 2015 uh, COPs? 330 first? 330. Yeah, it's not 3.30. 3.30, 3.40, 3.50. <laughs> okay, let me back up. I misunderstood. My apologies. The 3.30 is the drainage fund. Do you have any questions on the, on the drainage fund? It's similar instruction and, op and operation to previous years. Mr. Carlson? Um, Pat? This is unrelated to the bonds, I would take it, that we issued for drainage, and I thought we paid off last year and the year before. No, uh, we have not paid those off. Oh. We paid off the street. We paid off the 310, right. which was the street budget, the street bonds, I'm sorry. Right. But no, these, these still have just a year or two to go, and we'll have those done, completely done. And, and the money to pay those out come out of what fund? 
Uh, it comes from your monthly user charge, underwater bill, and uh, stormwater capital fees. Okay. So, I mean, as in the previous case, we paid them off as, you know, early because we had the money in the 410 account to do so. Okay. Uh, do, it, does that logic apply to paying these bonds off? Just get I don't believe these have a call date, which means we can't pay them off early. Okay. Uh, plus, we're, it, it, we're a year away from finishing them up. Okay. It would probably cost us more than we would say. That's what I'm hearing. Okay, if there's nothing further on the uh, drainage debt service fund, let's move on to stream 40, <coughs> which is the Memorial Park CLP debt. Do you have any questions, Council, on that fund that structure? Uh, on the, I mean, that's the short title for it, Memorial Park CLP. But that did roll in the previous CLP that we paid off for the police and, and the public works facility. So th th that payment, it, this employee payment includes uh, paying back the, the, the uh, principal on, on that too, right? So, so right now, instead of Memorial Park CLP debt service, it would be more Memorial Park Police Department and Public Works Facilities. No. No, go ahead, Walter. That's, that's not correct. Uh, this is simply the fund that captures the transfers from other funds into this fund to cover the payment. Right. That deals strictly with the 2015 COP payments. Yes, if. Uh, Included in those principal and interest payments in the expense section, yes, there is a portion of that that relates to the 99s. Yeah, because we had $1.6 million dollars left on the previous COP that had to be included in the financing of this COP. Right. Okay, so that's all covered. For all practical purposes, we used the, the um, proceeds from the COPs to pay those off. And, that, and so we just, it, it truly is only for Memorial Park, but it did absorb those others. But we've paid those off. Okay. Isn't that right? Isn't that how we did it? Yes. Yeah, so those are done. But, it, we, but we, we basically borrowed, they had the COPs, covered the costs of those other two projects, and now we're just paying the debt service on Memorial Park. So we've already paid that $1.6 off, so... Folks, it, it was again part of the COPs, right. and we're paying the debt service on, on, on the total. Okay. Okay. If there are no further questions, then let's move on to the 350 fund, which is the Aquatic Center Bond Debt Service Fund. Does uh, Council have any questions on the structure of that? Yeah. Um, we've, we've received, was it the 10.1 million entire that, in bonds? It was uh, slightly it was more than that because we had a premium associated with it. Okay. Um, now, right now we haven't used any of that money to pay for any expenses, right? Like construction expenses. Correct. Uh, and, and the A&E fees have been pretty much covered under, out of the general funds, not out of that bond money, right? Correct, but the intent, it, it, practically, yes. Um, mathematically and on my spreadsheets, the A&E uh, contract will be paid for with bond dollars, but all the dollars are mixed now, and mm -hmm. I'm just keeping track of all those separately. So we've invested the vast majority yeah. of the proceeds, both from the COPs and from the bonds. Uh, they're not a, they're ma not making a ton of money, but they're making right. a little bit. Yeah, because we're paying 3.5 percent interest on that money, uh, and that's part of the annual payments, the 700,000 that we have to pay every year. But we're also collecting that 1 percent interest or so from from the investment, or not, you know, that we put the money in the bank, so to speak, like about 1 percent or something less, probably. So does that interest show up in here at all? I'll defer to Wally. I think it does. If you uh, look at the statement of revenues, Mr. Carlson, the very first line, 350 says interest on deposits. Okay, so we got $10,000. <laughs> That's 1% of $10 million. 
yes, to keep the monies flexible um, and talking with various investment advisors from Science Bank, Vector Bank, et cetera, are the, the most advantageous for us to keep the funds as liquid as possible was to keep it in the money market fund. And if you follow your banking system, you know that most money market funds are paying one-tenth of one percent. However, I was able to get a quarter of a percent, so more than two and a half times the normal. So, uh, excuse the expression, big whoop, but, you know, on $10 million that's in there now, we're getting about 2200 a month in interest on the bonds, on the COP funds, which are still invested in another COP, where again I was able to get 0.25 percent, we're getting about seven or eight hundred dollars. So on all that, all that bond and COP monies, we're getting just under three thousand dollars a month in interest. Yeah. But of that ten million dollars, only seven hundred thousand need this year, seven hundred next year, etc. And so the vast majority of the ten million, you don't have to have liquid. Well, that's not true. That's not true. The seven hundred thousand is the debt payment. Right. But what the bulk of that $10 million is going to go into is the construction right. of the actual oh. aquatic center. Oh, okay. The bills. That's right. Yeah, you are going to use that yeah, for construction over the next year or so. Okay. Right. Correct. Right. Okay. Thank you for that uh, explanation. <laughs> okay. Anything else on debt service? Let's move on to 410 and edit the summary and then Bill can cover the uh, questions that you may have on the details. Should all have this kind of money. <laughs> yeah, this is this is a pretty powerful find, and we're using it as it was intended to do, and we're spending a lot of it over the next year. Which is why we're not printing them in Colorado Springs, is it? Exactly. You know, that's that's an excellent point. Uh, we're we've got an excellent payment management plan. We're going to be introducing the stormwater management plan. Uh, we're taking care of business. We're doing a lot of cash as it relates to the fleet maintenance facility. We're using a lot of 14 cash for uh, Memorial Park and for components of the aquatic center. Would any part of the 410 uh, fund be used for some of the proposed uh, traffic study recommendations? Not in 16. Yes, okay. Yeah, I, I had a number of questions on the capital outlay portion of this uh, budget. Uh, one had to do with uh, well, we're with the fourteen. So we're done with the summary. We're flipping. Well, yeah, yeah. Details. Just now for the actual. Okay. Okay. No, no questions over summary. Okay. On, other than it impacts on. Do if you would handle those? Yes, sir. Oh, Glad to. <coughs> okay. Um, earlier this evening, we asked Peak Internet when getting a permit to give us some basic information. What scope are we building? Okay. I'm, I'm asking that the city provide council with that same level of information, a <clears throat> drawing or whatever, of what is it you're requesting to spend $1.32 million on. Okay. Uh, you know, we need a little more detail. But also... Don't say we, Kimasabi. Well... I mean, if we're, if yeah, we're, we're not rubber stress. stamping. No, no, I, I would never ever stamp, but it's, I think it's a point of well taken. That you, you would like more detail. I would like to know. And that's why we have these discussions tonight. Right. So Bill's prepared to fill you in on how we're spending that money. Okay. Uh, so uh, so that would be one item, Is and, and it would be nice to see that if some of this is backed up by the, the uh, so, uh, stormwater plan that we've been working on for the last two years, which is supposed to be do due shortly, where we prioritize or at least identify what what drainage areas need to be improved and that sort of thing. So, uh, <coughs> but let me let me just ask you something. So, what you're looking for is uh, the the detailed year-to-year -year work product work effort. For stormwater and, and I would assume pavement management as well. Yeah. Well, in pavement management, we and, had that. Like and that. if that's what the council desires, we'll provide it to the council. If it's something that you would enjoy seeing, 
we'll sit down with you and, and show you once that work is done. Because we have that, the pavement management plan, for example, mm -hmm. identifies the majority, uh, I would say we have probably a 90% solution for the next year. Right. We know generally what that plan is going right. to look like. It's, a lot of it's driven by availability of funds. But we can, we can happily show you that. I just don't know that the entire council wants that level of detail. Uh, I don't need it. No, no, do I. Okay, I would like to see that sure. then. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I'd like to have a storm rain study. I'd like no, to not, see that's it. not completed yet. Okay, but it's supposed to be done this fall. What's the schedule, Bill? Yeah, it's we're winding it up right now. It yeah. be, should be done by the end of the year. Okay, so hopefully I'll have that information before we approve the budget. There's no well, projects there's associated with the the, the stormwater yeah. master plan in in this year's proposal. Then. Right. Okay, okay, so the, the stormwater plan doesn't justify well, this project. That, there's no construction projects. Right. There's $30,000 right. in one of the line items to start design work of spin-off projects from the stormwater master plan. Remember some years ago, Council, we went through the goals and objectives, and we said we were going to, after the end of the stormwater management plan, we allocated how many hundreds of thousands each year? Two or three. A lot of money. And we said, we're going to put aside 30000 every year right. for design for the next year's 300 Yeah, it's 10%. And then start staggering that. Right. So that's, this year we'll get a, that first part of the design done for 2017 implementation. Yeah. No, I'm well aware of that. That was in my email. I said, this is what your spreadsheet from 2013 right. showed, right. Uh, 330 for a bunch of years. <coughs> uh, and then... When this came in, it was exactly four times three and thirty. Yeah, purely coincidental. Yeah, purely coincidental. Because the project that's the highest order of magnitude, as I mentioned to you before, is a quasi-emergency fix. It's a planned emergency fix, and it's one point two million on Fountain Creek. Yes, sir. Correct. Most of that goes okay. to Fountain Creek, the Safeway Reach, which is being designed right now, this year. Right. I saw people so out there digging holes. Yes. Okay. Uh, the second item I had in there uh, had to do with, in the 2015 budget, it included $86,821 to reimburse the uh, last fund. Uh, and uh, is, is that, are those payments back to the RLF fund, now that we've gone away from RLF, are those still being made? Because I don't see it here as a payment and projected at the end of 2015. You know, this is one of the reasons why I'm suggesting that we get rid of the RLF. It served us very well in the early 2000s, and we were struggling to do a lot of budgeting things. Uh, and we, we, we borrow from ourselves. So it's pencil entries that we pay cash for an item up front mm -hmm. because the person we're buying it from won't let us make payments unless we do a lease. And then we have to pay interest. So the concept was we're going to borrow from ourselves from the larger pot of the pooled funds and then each entity would pay back. So it, it really, there's once we pay cash for it, there's no other monies that come in or go away. Okay, but, so there, there's no intent now to pay into this pot of money then? No. Okay, that, gonna, that's terminated in 15 then? In 16. <laughs> we're okay. going to finish up 15 with the plan that we have, and, but, it, but it really, again, it doesn't matter because we've already bought everything. We pay cash right. for it because that's what we, that's how we save money is paying cash for and it. And that was the confusing part is what account did we pay the cash out and why are we continuing to pay over 10 years towards that same plan? Because it, it took the peaks and valleys right. out of our department budgets. Yeah, I, I, I didn't want to go into the details of how we operate the RLF. I just wanted to know in this one instance, if part of transition to eliminating RLF, we still felt there was an obligation to pay that eighty something thousand dollars. No, because the obligation was almost artificial. Okay. Okay, so it's not. Uh, okay. And then on the last one, um, we of course have this transportation study and a community meeting on that. Mm -hmm. And my take on that, and perhaps we'll get to take from other people too, is that the only item in there that enjoyed popular support was pedestrianizing Quinn Alley. Okay? 
and that I'll get counter opinions on that. There were school Seven, projects. What? There were school projects that rated very highly. Yeah, but those those aren't really transportation. <laughs> well, there was the yeah. So it's a roundabout, and there's yeah. and speed humps in the school zone. That was one of the top seven projects. Yeah, but that has a, that's that's not transportation related to 24 <laughs> problems. Route US 24. The traffic study was not about 24. Okay. It was the alternative routes and traffic circulation everywhere in town. Okay, so I'll give you that too. But the big thing was pedestrianizing Quinn Alley, and the board Main Street board had asked. Brian to put into the budget uh, some design money, just like you need to have design money for your out year projects too, uh, $40,000 to pay for. Well, right now uh, we're getting a dollar grant or something to pay for um, the concept design. And we're, we're using a professor and his students to come and do that. And it's like $1,800. I mean, nothing. But we, we're looking for uh, also $40,000 to do the follow-on from that concept design to come up with the design so that should we have funds available in 2017 or that that we at least we would then have know what the cost of it is what it's going to look like and all that kind of stuff so that when we are prepared in 2017 for uh, pedestrianizing Quinn Alley or at least have that project there and so we, rather than putting this under economic development earlier, we're proposing this is a capital project because it certainly is going to be more than five thousand uh, dollars. And and uh, so we, we're looking to put in a Main Street board is looking to put in some design money. Now, whether you want to just have a placeholder in there or whatever, because during the year, you know, there's a lot of, I mean, any increase in sales tax would easily pay for it probably. So. Uh, as in, in past cases, we could put a notional amount in there because we don't know what it's going to actually cost. So we get the AE you know, proposals of uh, a notional amount to, to at least endorse the idea that one of the big things that it did enjoy public support was pedestrian friendly downtown area. So I'm, I'm proposing to add something into this portion of the budget under expenditures, capital expenditures for that initial design effort in 2016. As I mentioned to you in the, the email, the original line item amount was the 40000 um, I didn't grasp that it was intended for the Quinale issue. Right. So uh, I, after discussions with Brian, we knocked that down to the $25,000. Right. Uh, certainly council says that's where they want to dedicate funds. Uh, it will be absolutely taking money away from the aquatic center. So I think we just, you, you need to, it, 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 that may not be true if you're this is 410. Um, it's 410. It, it'll have an impact somewhere, somehow. Yeah. I'm just not convinced based on that report. And we have the final report. We just got the draft. Okay. I'm not sure what the final report is going to say. Uh, it was fairly easy to uh, have that popular support for that Quinn Alley concept. I don't know that it's completely practical. I think we need to finish reviewing the report. We need to see if it makes sense, uh, and then bring that back to council and let council okay. help us make that decision. Uh, and, and I agree with that. It, it, it may have received popular support in that forum, but it was one of many options. So why why would we dedicate money to that above and beyond, or without some rank order of all of the projects? Well, certainly the final report should reflect what happened in that meeting. Mm -hmm. But the vast majority of the other options, other than the traffic circle or the, the raised uh, walkway in front of the school, the, the southern bypass and the northern bypass and all these others were I mean, anything that would take traffic flow off of 24 and, and route it through neighborhoods was vehemently objected to sure by our residents. Sure. That's yeah, and so uh, certainly I'm willing to wait to see the, what the traffic study says. You said you already got the pre-final, you said. And so in the near future, we, we can take the results of that. And I would like to be able to implement the, the results of that study 
in 2017. So there's going to be some preliminary work and needed design work in 2016. 2016. In 2017 or? In 2017 would be implementation. In 16 would be the design, just like we're doing on the stormwater projects. I understand. Okay. I understand the intent. Yeah. But I think your recommendation is valid. Let's let's study the, the final report. Okay. Well, I, I have given that some thought, and okay. it's been my intent that we get the final report, which will be due to this year end, and then we do 16 to kind of digest that, look at that, and plan forward, and then we start the design work in 17 uh, in a bit more deliberate fashion uh, rather than rushing to it in 16, because 16 is pretty well committed on things that are already in the queue. Yeah. And so we'll use the, the results of that study in 17 to start doing those plans. Because we're, uh, and you'll see in the general fund, I'm sorry, the 410. I have every dollar planned and programmed in there right now for something. I could There's easily find $40,000 out of $2.378 million. Dollars. <laughs> I would recommend number one. Is there support for this? No, I not at this point. So let's, let's move on. Well, yeah, I'd, I'd like to take the support measure when we see the traffic study. That's fine. Okay. But I mean, at this moment, we don't have it. It's kind of a moot point, and there's no support to do anything at this very moment. So. Right. But I'm just bring, raising the subject because we got to that point in the budget. Yeah, but uh, I would expenses. agree with Bill that we need to look at it deliberatively, look at it in 2016 for projected expenditures in 17. Mm -hmm. That's what I would support. Good. Other, Other questions, questions on 410? Yeah. Anything else on 410 for Wally? For me. I'm sorry. <laughs> Bill, excuse me. If not, I think we're done with today's schedule. I so. I, I think, Council, if you look at the general fund, you know it's always the long hole in the tent when it comes to budget. It's the thing that we always need to protect. Uh, I think your staff has done an exceptional job in keeping expenses down. Uh, we've been conservative in our approach on predicting revenues and conservative in predicting our expenses. There's a lot of variables, which is why we need to protect that 10% reserve that you uh, mandated that we keep. We have got it down to it's razor thin uh, with the expenditures for different projects. It's a 10% reserve, not 10.1%. Well, I have one more question on equipment purchases in my email. I'd also mentioned, and you were going to offer, you know, what is our procurement schedule for equipment? For equipment? We can both that together. Thank you. So, Council, with that, we'll look forward to next meeting's discussion on the other funds. Great. Thank you very much, staff. Great job, as always. Thank I appreciate it. Getting it all together. Um, and I know that Pat was here and wanted to make a comment. Did she give something to you, Sally? Does we have a letter? Everything you it's in our packet. Copies, okay. out on the dimes for them. Everyone has a copy? Yes. Yeah. Okay, terrific. Then that said, I think uh, we can move forward. Um, I have no, no one on my list today for public comment. Is there anyone here that would like to comment? No, if not, we'll move on to reports. Um, I'm going to start with the student art on the wall right behind Mr. Dingwell, Elevate Your Education. This, this one happened to be um, brought to us by Kelsey Carter, and we're going to try to display these around the city. There are a number of beautiful paintings like this that are in the admin building, and they do a great job. We're trying to encourage the, uh, the paintings to be shown throughout the community. So if anyone has any great ideas, um, I'm sure the students and the school board would like to get these out um, the best they can. Matter of fact, I might have one at the restaurant. Those are beautiful. They do a great job. So this is Kelsey Carter. She's a high school senior, and uh, it's a, I think they're all elevate your education, wasn't that? That's the thing. Yes. That was, that was the thing. So thanks for that. Um, a few events of note um, for the next couple of weeks. Sunday, October 18th, uh, we're going to dedicate the mural. At, for the Woodland Parks Arts Alliance at the U-Pass Cultural Center from 3 to 5. That should be a great event. For those of you that have seen that mural, it is unbelievable. Uh, Tuesday, October 20th is business after hours in the basement of Vector Bank. We moved it inside from outside. 
from 5.30 to 7. That's this coming Tuesday. Saturday, October 24th, let's dance the night away fundraiser for the Pikes Peak Regional Medical Center Foundation. Also at the Ute Pass Cultural Center from 7 to 10. And $10 per person. Call 244-3969 for more information. Uh, then Thursday, November 5th, Chamber Lunch and Learn. It's a quick books overview from 11.30 to 2. And call Deb at 687-9885. And last Thursday, November 5th, is the Chamber Business Expo, which I'm sure is sold out, or it will be. Uh, UPass Cultural Center from 5 to 7. Um, and that's all I have. Council, okay, would you like to start? Yes, uh, last night um, the Charter Review Committee met again, and uh, Aaron, appreciate your support, and Suzanne, as always. Uh, pretty productive meeting. We uh, covered five more potential amendments to be um, introduced on a possible ballot initiative in April. Uh, we'll probably finish up our effort um, early December. Our intent is to put it on the agenda for uh, initial posting and uh, in early January, and I think it would be the second council meeting in January that we'll actually have a public hearing on the ordinances. So um, most of our recommendations will be housekeeping. Uh, a couple might be substantive uh, policy changes. Uh, we are still looking at Section 917, which prohibits public uh, or using city funds for uh, incentivizing uh, public projects. Um, and then, of course, we also addressed uh, vacancies of uh, for mayor and council positions, and we've come up with a, a, a slight modification to a current section of the, the charter. But otherwise, it's, it's, it's a lot about cleaning up um, a charter that has served us well, but maybe just behind the times a little bit, and maybe some of the language is a little bit stilted. So uh, I don't think we're going to knock anyone's socks off with our recommendations, but we should be able to make those to the council in January. Then secondly, uh, I'll be attending the CML Policy Committee meeting tomorrow, and I asked Suzanne to put out the action items for uh, the council to review before I go up there. I haven't received any input. Uh, I will be voting uh, with all of the CML staff recommendations for uh, various legislation. Uh, I've got till tomorrow morning if anyone has any burning desire to refute any of the, the staff recommendations from CML, but uh, there are several that do apply to our community, so I would invite you to take a look at those. Otherwise, I have nothing else. Great. Thanks, you I just want to thank you and, and your whole staff uh, or your whole committee for the charter review. Uh, Lots of work, uh, great leadership, and it's very much appreciated. Thank you. Mr. Carlson. Yeah, talking about schedules, um, we had a 6 o'clock executive session scheduled for this evening that got canceled. Uh, as I understand, um, our attorney Aaron didn't have a lot of time to, to get, prepare for that. Uh, when it, Can we reschedule that in the near future? or when? Yeah. Yes, indeed. Uh, indeed. Aaron, you had a, a kind of a draft a schedule of activities that would happen between now and November 5th, which is when we intend to have that executive session. Oh, and no, November 5th? Yes. Be next that, meeting. Because yeah. exactly. there's some things we're going to work on and okay. then bring that to the council November 5th. Okay. So we should anticipate that. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. So, so we'll have a 6 o'clock meeting on the 5th, then? Yeah, it plan on it. it it's either going to be 6 or 5.30. Aaron and I'll have that discussion. Okay. We want to be respectful of your time, but we also want to make sure that we have time to finish the issues. Okay. Anything else, Bob? No. Kim? I have nothing. Thank you, sir. Phil? Nothing, Mr. Mayor. Okay. We will move on to Aaron Smith. I have nothing. Here. Nothing. Thanks again for all your work uh, with Peak Internet and uh, right away. Looks like we're all heading in the right direction. So thank, thank you. you. Had, a, had a great team to work with. Good process, Mr. Bailey. No, no sir, nothing else. You have nothing. Okay, I don't have any comment on written correspondence, so this meeting is now adjourned.
Well, I'm just going to get it.